Proverbs chapter 4, we're going to read verses 23 through 27. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. It says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to thy right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Uh, the message tonight is one that I have actually, and this might be part one of the message because it was part one, bef it was part one before. I actually preached this message a year and a half ago as we were working through Proverbs. And I can't believe it's been a year and a half already. And over the last year or so, I've, I've had the desire to preach this message again because I really believed it was, I mean, every message is important, but this particular message I thought was especially important. And I looked back and I, I saw that it was, it's already been a year and a half since I preached it. And it's one of those that you could, you could have, I could preach this every year and it would be an important message to preach every year. And so the message tonight, focused on verse 23, is keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The message is guard your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for this very important verse and these verses and this important subject. And I pray that you'd please speak to hearts and may we have open hearts to receive your word and may it have the desired effect uh, to, to make the changes in our lives that need to be to convict us, challenge us, encourage us, and that you would most of all be honored and glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. What we see in these verses is the effect that the heart has on every other aspect of life. In verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What issues of life? I could, well, issues of life or any type of issues of life. The issues of your life are very much influenced by the condition of your heart. And I read verses 24 through 27 because it, it goes along with what comes out of the heart. In verse 24, put fro away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. So what we speak, uh, verse 25, what we look at, uh, verse 26, what way we go, uh, the, the, the ways of our lives. And verse 27 goes along with the ways of our lives. Just uh, ponder the path of thy feet, let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. The human heart is roughly the size of a large fist. The heart weighs between 10 to 12 ounces in men and 8 to 10 ounces in women. The heart beats about 100,000 times per day, which results, depending on lifespan, but about 3 billion beats in a lifetime. An adult heart beats about 60 to 80 times per minute. Newborn's hearts beat faster than adult hearts, about 70 to 190 beats per minute. The heart pumps about 6 quarts of blood throughout the body. The heart is located in the center of the chest, usually pointing slightly left. And uh, what's interesting here is when it says in verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, it's not talking about your physical heart. But we see in, this, in the Bible the similarities when the Bible talks about the heart of man, that's in, in a spiritual sense, uh, it is similar to the heart, to the physical heart. Your heart, I, I, I probably won't, uh, won't read all of this, uh, but just to read some of this, your heart is a muscular organ that pumps blood to your body. Your heart is at the center of your circulatory system. An electrical system controls your heart and uses electrical signals to contract the heart's walls. Your heart is vital to your health and nearly everything that goes on in your body. Without the heart's pumping action, blood can't move throughout your body. Your blood carries the oxygen and nutrients that your organs need to work well. Blood also carries carbon dioxide, a waste product, to your lungs so you can breathe it out. A healthy heart supplies your body with the right amount of blood at the rate needed to work well. If disease or injury weakens your heart, your body's organs won't receive enough blood to work normally. And so what happens is, if there's something wrong with your physical heart, if there's something wrong with your physical heart, you will see that manifested often in other areas of life, other aspects, because your heart affects so many other things in your body. So what's the significance then? If Well, keep 
A lot of people are concerned with keeping their physical heart healthy. And that's a good thing. That's, that's certainly not a bad thing. It's, we, we need to be try to take care the best we can of, of, of the bodies God has given us. And it starts, uh, the heart is very, very important with that. But you know what's really even more important is the condition of your spiritual heart. And your spiritual heart is going to affect other aspects of your life. Not, not just your body, like your physical heart, but other aspects of your life. It's going to affect your mind. It's going to affect, your, uh, it's going to affect the, the choices you make. Now, the word keep means to guard, protect, and maintain. So when the Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, it means you need to guard your heart, protect your heart, maintain your heart. Uh, there, may be people who, um, there may be people who have to avoid caffeine because, boy, I need to... I need to guard against uh, anything that would make my heart race or cause heart palpitations. Some people just can't handle too much. And by the way, even a healthy person, if you'd get overloaded in caffeine, uh, that's not a good thing for your heart either. And so there, but, but people who are especially sensitive to that might not even be able to drink too much caffeinated coffee or maybe even a caffeinated soda because uh, it's just, you know, that's just not good for my heart. I'm getting heart palpitations uh, from this. And... Um, and so that is, is, uh, is something that people want to guard against and protect. You know, what, wow, if that's not good for my heart, I don't want to do that. Just the way we would want to protect our physical heart, we should even more so want to protect our spiritual heart. Guard it, protect it, maintain it. And what is the heart? The heart is, uh, it's our feelings, it's our will, it's our intellect. It's, it's, you could really say it's the seat of our emotions. It's the seat of our feelings, will, and intellect in the, in the best way to say it would be it's simply the center of one's being. Just like the heart is right here near the center of our chest, right kind of um, not in, exactly in the center of our body, but if you took it and it's, it's, it's right at a very important centralized location. You know, when we say near and dear to my heart, it doesn't take much of an arm movement to, to put your hand where your heart is. Very much close uh, and, uh, and, and in a very prominent place. The heart, word heart is used 833 times in the Bible. And that could be talking about one's physical heart. It could be talking about their spiritual heart. Why is the heart so important? Why is the heart so important? This is, we're going to look at a number of scriptures tonight about that. And first, let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Why is the heart, the spiritual heart now, why is the spiritual heart so important? Genesis 6, 1 through 6, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto men, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So God's heart was grieved because of the condition of man's heart. And what was the condition of man's heart? It was the natural inclination of man's heart is toward evil. It's toward wickedness. And that's why when there is not the deliberate being grounded in God's word and, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, the natural inclination of society, of, of individuals, is going to be worse and worse. And then as a society, if you have more and more people like that in a society, the natural inclination is going to be worse and worse, more and more evil. Now, there have been, some, there have been very evil uh, cultures and societies in the past, so I'm not saying that this is the most wicked and evil society that's ever existed. And apparently, things were so bad and so corrupted and so perverse back at that time that uh, God said, he, he repented the Lord to have made man on the earth. He said, I just wish I wouldn't have made man. And it, he was so grieved by that. And he decided, I'm going to destroy man who I'm going to cre have created. And that's what led into the flood, which destroyed everybody except eight people. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so the natural inclination of the heart 
is to evil. Turn to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. And I love verse 22. This, is, this might be one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And of course, I, I can't pick a favorite verse in the Bible. But, uh, but this is, for some reason, I just love this because it, it's just a promise of God. I love this, this particular promise of God. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And so then Jeremiah chapter uh, 17 and, and verse 7. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. We will be coming back to Genesis. So if you want to keep your finger there to um, uh, come back more quickly, you can certainly do that. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out of roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, and neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Then he goes on into verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. And so we see a, a, a principle and a truth about what the heart is like, uh, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And so one of the worst pieces of advice that someone can give is to someone else is just simply, you know, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. I mean, just do what feels right to you. Follow your heart. Most likely that's going to tend toward wickedness, evil, and bad decisions. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. No, it's verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. You need to trust in the Lord. Don't trust in your own heart. Your heart can be very deceitful. You can lie to yourself. And there are a lot of people who are concerned about being lied to by others. But, you know, one of the things we really need to be concerned about is lying to ourselves, our own heart lying to us, deceiving us. And that's one of the most dangerous things. So the heart is so important because of the natural inclination of the heart. We need to understand what the heart is inclined to do, is inclined to be like. And then uh, number two, why the heart is so important is because of uh, the, it's, it's in the heart is where one's belief in God is decided, either belief or disbelief. Uh, the, the, the psalm says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. He didn't say it in his intellect. He didn't just come up with it in his mind. It's a deep-rooted heart issue when someone says there is no God. It says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And so the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They didn't come to that through some logical uh, explanation of their own uh, way of thinking or some scientific way. Now, there's no scientific way to say, oh, there's definitely no God. Uh, but it's just simply, I will not believe. That is the issue. It's the stubbornness and rebellious of, rebelliousness of the heart. And then the third reason the heart is so important is because of the motivations of the heart. Turn back to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and, Sh Kadesh and Shur and Sojourn and Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself, said, he is my brother. Notice what he says here. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to 
touch her. And so he had special protection because God knew. God was showing him mercy and grace uh, because he knew that he was, he was not looking to do something wicked and ungodly. He was just, it was an innocent uh, choice, an innocent mistake because he did not know. And so God protected him. God helped him. But God saw, he says, I know thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. And so the, the third reason why the heart is so important is because the heart is the source of our motivations for good or for bad. A person can have bad motivations or like Abimelech here, a person could have good motivations, but it starts in the heart. One of the reasons why the heart is so important and therefore we should keep our heart with all diligence. And then number four, the, the heart is the source of one's willingness to give and to serve. Exodus chapter 35. Let's go to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. Exodus 35 and verses 4 and 5. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and purple and, uh, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. And I'll stop there. I'll stop with verse 5. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. And so the, the motivations or the willingness, one's willingness to give and to serve, really starts in the heart. And in verse 21, it says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And verse 29, The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing, to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And then as far as service is concerned, 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. So there you see the motivation. Consider how great things he's done for you. God's done great things for me, so I want to do some things for him. Out of a willing heart, I want to give to God's work. I want to cheerfully give. I'm going to purpose in my heart to give. Another reason the heart is so important is found in Numbers chapter 32. Go to Numbers chapter 32. Numbers 32, starting in verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. When they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priests and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eli, Eli, um, Eli, Eliali, excuse me, Eliali, and uh, Shebam, and Nebo, and Beon, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not uh, over Jordan. And so, so this is the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of, of Gad. They're saying, let's just, let us stay on the other side of Jordan. We're not really interested in going, crossing the Jordan into the promised land because this is the type of land we want. So they're asking for this. Verse 6, And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Verse 7, And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers, when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land, for when they went up unto the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And so uh, Moses is, is telling them, look, when, when we first decided, when God said we need to go into that land, we sent spies in there. 
And that report from the spies was not good for 10 of the spies. And so they discouraged the heart of the people. So even if you're going to stay over here, you need to come help us fight the battles so that the rest of the people aren't discouraged, that their heart is not discouraged. And so the, the, the fifth reason why the heart is so important is that the heart is the place where a person is discouraged. And that's why discouragement can be so crippling in a person's life because, and, and, and so uh, consequential in a person's life because it's a heart issue. It's something deep down that when a person gets discouraged, it, it can take some, some time and some real um, you know, maybe intervention of the Lord or some sort of intervention to get encouraged again because it can get deep-rooted in the heart. Now, discouragement is the opposite of courage. Courage is that, that boldness of going forward and, and accomplishing what is at hand, whereas discouragement is an absence of courage, and so it can be paralyzing. So in this case, if they weren't going to help them fight the battles, uh, it says, Wherefore, discourage ye the heart of the children from, of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them. So if the rest of the tribes see that, oh, two tribes are standing over here, oh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we better not go either. Maybe we better not take that land and possess the land. So you need to come help us take that land, even if you're not going to dwell there. And so, because uh, he, he says, he reminds them of what happened uh, when those spies uh, in the previous generation uh, had gone into the land and, uh, and came back with a discouraging report. Now, they, they, two of the spies said, yes, this is a great land. Let's, let's go get it. Joshua and Caleb, they had courage. They had boldness. But the ten spies discouraged the hearts of the children of Israel, and there were great consequences for that. And the sixth reason uh, that the heart is so important is that the heart is the source of rejoicing. So kind of an opposite, not opposite completely, but... Uh, but still on the different ends of, of as far as categories are concerned, as, good and, as far as good and bad, is a good type of thing is the rejoicing of the heart. 1 Samuel 2, 1 says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. And so notice what she said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. This wasn't just a dry, superficial, my mouth is rejoicing, that my mouth is singing forth the praise of, and, and the, the speaking forth the praise of salvation. No, it was coming deep down within her, the center of her being, that she was rejoicing in the Lord for His blessing, His provision. Proverbs fifteen thirteen says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. And so the heart condition is, is very important because if it's merry, if you deep down you're merry and you're joyful, uh, that, is, that affects your countenance. But your spirit is a, is a more discouraged, broken spirit if you have sorrow in your heart. And then number seven, uh, the heart is the source of conviction place of conviction. 1 Samuel 24, 5 says, And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. 2 Samuel 24, 10, And David's heart smote him after he, that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And, uh, you know, it's, it's 2020. It's a census year. Well, David took a census of the people, and uh, his heart smote him for that, for numbering the people. And, uh, but notice where the conviction originated, where it came from. It was, it was rooted in the heart. His heart smote Have you ever done something that you're, you're, your heart just smites you? You just kind of get boom. You, feel, you, you realize, I shouldn't have done that. That's conviction that's deep down in the heart. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. The right kind of conviction is the kind of conviction that turns us to the Lord, that we want to get it right with the Lord. And we see that with David here in 2 Samuel uh, when he says, I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And so he, his conviction was not the type of conviction of like the sorrow of the world which worketh death. The sorrow of the world is, oh, they might be sorry for some things or might even be sorry for consequences, 
but they don't turn to the Lord. But the godly sorrow, the, the, the godly conviction, is when then we, it causes us, it prompts us to turn to the Lord and get right with Him. And that's why the heart is so important. Maintaining a healthy spiritual heart because that's the place where conviction takes place. When you hear preaching and, and the Lord uh, uh, convicts you about something, touches on your life of something you hear in the preaching, uh, that's, that's God working on your heart. So if we pray, God, would you please work in hearts today? That's, that's what we mean, is that God, would, that God would, would convict and encourage and do the work that needs to be done deep down inside uh, spiritually of that person. Uh, the eighth reason is that, influ that your heart influences what comes out of the mouth. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Your heart influences what comes out of your mouth. Matthew, Mark, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 33. Either make the tree good or his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So when you hear what comes out of a person's mouth, you're getting a glimpse of what's in their heart. You're getting a glimpse. And with some people, you get more of a glimpse than others. You, you get more than a glimpse. <laughs> you get to know very well what's in a person's heart based on what comes out of their mouth. And so maintaining a, the, the right heart, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of, the, out of it are the issues of life. Uh, out of it comes words. There's things that come out of your mouth based on what is in your heart. And then turn to Matthew chapter 15, the ninth reason that the heart is so important is that your heart is the real you. Your heart, what's in your heart is the real you. Matthew chapter 15, and um, well, we'll start reading at verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of, Jer of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the, uh, the tradition of the elders? For they, not, for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And um, let's look at verse 8. It says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So they say all the, it sounds like they're saying the right things. They appear on the outside they're doing the right things, but Jesus could see right through them that they were very hypocritical. Because uh, he called them hypocrites. He said, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, and their heart uh, is far from me. Because the Pharisees, the scribes, they set up their own standard of righteousness. They had their own ideas of what was right and what was wrong. Here's our standard, but yet they had double standards. They had their own traditions that were not what God had given and so Jesus called them, you're hypocrites. In verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Verse 10, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceedeth, proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter uh, of the Pharisees, and he was getting to the heart that, you know, they, they want to look really good on the outside. They want everybody to wash their hands. 
Uh, they want everybody to, 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 to do their traditions. Um, and by the way, you know, with all that's going on right now, it's a good thing to wash your hands. But the fact of the matter is, uh, washing your hands, and they have their traditional type of wa hand washing, is, is that it didn't replace the condition of their heart. It didn't affect the condition of their heart. That you know what, we might have a nation, I, I think I said this this morning, we might have the cleanest country that we've had in a long time as far as disinfecting places and all kinds of things, uh, people washing their hands. Wow, we're, we're having a revival of, of basic hygiene. And I was kind of amused at what um, uh, this notification I got from, from, from Google uh, on my phone. And it said, uh, help stop the coronavirus. And so they're trying to think of a simple way to, uh, to remind people, do the five is what they call it. Do the five. Help stop coronavirus. So number one, hands. Wash them often. Number two, elbow. Cough into it. Number three, face, don't touch it. Number four, feet, stay more than three feet apart. So sorry, can't get too close to you. Uh, number five, feel sick, stay home. That is the answer for stopping the spread of coronavirus. And, and so, uh, that, you know, according to Google, and I guess it says World Health Organization, it's a public service announcement. Um, so, yes, there are good things to do for, for basic hygiene and stopping the spread of germs. But, you know, no matter how much Americans clean their physical hands does not affect in one way the condition of their heart, does not affect the spiritual condition of America. And I can tell you what God is more concerned about. Now, go ahead. Yes, we need to keep our hands clean. But God is more concerned about the hearts of people than he is how clean their hands are. Jesus didn't rebuke his disciples for eating with unwashed hands. And I think we should wash our hands before we eat. That's, that's not the point. But Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter. He says, these are the things which defile a man. You're, you're so worried about the germs you get on the outside, but yet you're not worried about what's in the heart. And that's what Jesus is most concerned about here. Because it's the real you. Uh, you don't need to turn here, um, but 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-4, through 4, I'll, I'll read that. Uh, it says, um, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they, they also may, be, may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so here we see once again the contrast between the outward and the inward. What is most important in God's sight? Now people will use this principle to say, see, God doesn't care what's on the outside. God doesn't care how we appear and how we look. That's not the point of these verses. It's not an excuse to say, well, then I can just do whatever I want on the outside. That's not the point. The point is God is more concerned with what originates in the heart. And when your heart condition is right, it's going to then be expressed. It's going to be manifest in what is on the outside. Just as Jesus said in, uh, back in Matthew 15, he said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man for out of the heart proceed. And it goes through all these things, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. So does Jesus care what comes out on the outside? Absolutely. It's just simply he's recognizing, he's pointing out to them. It doesn't start on the outside. It starts with the condition of your heart. And then uh, lastly tonight, number 10, the 10th reason why the heart is so important. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Acts 8 and verse 26. It says, uh, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went, and, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures, of our treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. 
was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired, desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom thou speakest the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And notice in verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believing in the tenth reason that the heart is so important is that believing in the heart is necessary for salvation. Believing in the heart is necessary for salvation. And one more scripture, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that, w that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they pre hear? without a preacher. And it goes on, how shall they preach except they be sent? What does, this, what does the Bible say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That salvation takes place first and foremost by believing in your heart, in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And then the mouth part comes when a person recognizes and they believe in their heart and the, what comes out of their mouth, calling on the Lord is a, just simply an expression of what is already in the heart. And that's why we need to be careful about not uh, pressuring people into praying prayers, uh, just repeating some words, because if they don't have conviction in their heart and they're not believing in their heart, it doesn't matter what words they say, it doesn't matter what prayer they pray, that's not salvation. The pr a prayer that is prayed should be with, uh, with done with the conviction and the belief in the heart first, and then what comes out of the mouth is simply an expression of what is already in the heart. And so the heart is so important. Believing in because believing in the heart, believing that 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 belief in uh, which is necessary for salvation starts in the heart. Believing rooted in the heart. Heartfelt belief is necessary for salvation. And so that is, uh, the, those are ten reasons why that the heart is so important. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, Lord willing, next Sunday night we'll finish uh, with this, part two, and that will focus on how to guard your heart. What, then, and then what do we need to do to guard our hearts, to maintain, to protect, to, to care for, uh, and keep our hearts and there's some very important principles from Scripture uh, that, uh, that will help us in doing that. If someone said, you know, how do I guard my heart, my physical heart? How do I keep, how do I maintain my physical heart? Well, you know, those, there's things, just do a web search. How do I, how do I protect my heart? How do I uh, promote good heart health? There's all kinds of things you'll find out there about promoting good heart health. But what we need for a spiritual heart is how do we guard our hearts? And that's what we'll focus on, Lord willing, next Sunday night. So what is the condition of your heart? 
do you, do you do anything to keep your heart? Do you recognize the importance of your heart? Have you believed in your heart for, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Maybe, you're, you, maybe you've been dealing with some external issues and you realize now, based on what the Bible says, you know, I really need to get down to the heart of some matters, get down to the root of an issue, and that will make the difference. Let's recognize the importance of the heart and when you recognize the importance of the heart, it will then prioritize maintaining and keeping the heart.